Dr. Goldhammer. Just wanted to thank you for taking the time to answer some questions. Um, you know, I've got a, a channel that I help people with plant-based diet, and um, you know, I've seen your your videos, and also recently the Advanced Study Weekend, mm -hmm. um, where you talk there. So it's it's really great to be able to talk to you about some of the fasting as well as um, you know general issues with plant-based diet questions that they have. Um, would you like to give us a little overview of your background and, and your clinic, just to help some of the viewers who may not be familiar with you? Well, sure. Um, I've been uh, the director of the True North Health Center for the past uh, 30 years. And True North Health Center is a group of integrated doctors. We have doctors of medicine, uh, osteopathy, chiropractic, naturopathy, and psychology working in an integrated fashion, uh, with our focus being nutritional medicine. So we use diet, uh, particularly a plant-based, vegan, SOS-free diet, and also uh, the use of medically supervised water-only fasting. Uh, and we do fasting from anywhere from 5 to 40 days in a controlled setting. And we work with a lot of people that have uh, conditions uh, including high blood pressure and cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and a host of autoimmune disorders uh, quite successfully using uh, fasting followed by a plant-based diet and, of course, incorporating uh, basic lifestyle issues of exercise, sleep, et cetera. With regards to... Uh, we also have uh, our, our, our True North Health Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, educate, uh, it's uh, public education and, and primary research, so we're actively involved in doing uh, research in terms of investigating the best application of these methods uh, and, and how to use it. Somebody was asking about, um, you did some studies with, on blood pressure with um, T. Colin Campbell, and um, they were wondering, you could talk a little bit about that and the results, but also um, if anyone looked at long-term um, follow-up on these patients to see if they still had the results on staying off the medications and that type of thing. Yeah. So we did a study, uh, our first paper was uh, entitled Medically Supervised Water-Only Fasting in the Treatment of Hypertension. And we did that with uh, Dr. Campbell uh, from Cornell University. Um, and we took 174 consecutive patients with high blood pressure, put them through period of fasting, followed up with diet. Uh, and of the 174 patients, 100, 174 people were able to lower their blood pressure enough to eliminate the need for medication. We do have up to one year follow-ups on those patients and uh, quite clearly patients that stick to health promoting diet maintain uh, the results. Like anything, there is no cure for hypertension, you manage it. Uh, same thing with obesity, same thing with basically any of these conditions. Uh, health results from healthful living, if people live healthily, they're able to sustain the results. If they don't, they're going to uh, eventually get the problems back. So. Uh, fortunately, we have highly motivated patients, so we were able to get uh, those highly motivated patients to do well over the long run. I, I just actually got my first 30-year follow-up on a patient um, uh, not long ago. He was a gentleman who I originally saw was 55 years old, and at the time, he really objected to the strictness of the diet that I was recommending, and he asked if he was going to have to do it forever, and I said no, he wouldn't wouldn't have to do it forever, just, just for 50 years. And then once we cut a 50-year follow-up, he'd be free to do whatever he wanted. Well, he's come in now for his 30-year follow-up. And I hadn't seen him in 14 years. He said he was just coming in for a checkup. He was doing fine. And uh, he said that it, he seemed like the diet was working because all of his friends were dead. <laughs> One of his children had just passed away from a cardiac event uh, who wasn't on the program. And so he said he was going to... Uh, keep his word and stick to the program for another 20 years, but after that, he couldn't make any promises. <laughs> so I asked him to set up a follow-up, and he went out and set up another follow-up for 14 years from now, so I imagine I'll see him again when he's 99. Yeah, he probably will. They evaluate that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I find, like, in my case, it's a mental mind shift that, like, I don't expect to change, um, you know, versus in the past when you've had a you know, you've moderated, you've tried to cut out some junk, but it wasn't a complete switch to a plant-based uh, diet. It just, and the taste bud adjustments and all that. Well, if people read our book, The Pleasure Trap, they'll find that The Pleasure Trap 
as we describe it, is the hidden force that undermines health and happiness. It's the reason why people get fat, it's the reason why people are sick, and it's the artificial stimulation of dopamine in the brain that comes, whether it be from drugs or also the chemicals added to food. We add chemicals to food that artificially stimulate the same cascade, just like drugs do, and those chemicals include oil and sugar. And what happens is these chemicals that stimulate the dopamine cascade in our brain lead to overeating, and so we get the diseases of dietary excess. And these diseases that used to be rare are now ubiquitous. They used to be called the diseases of kings because it was only the wealthy elite kings that could get them, and those diseases include cardiovascular disease, including high blood pressure, diabetes, and autoimmune diseases. And, of course, those are the conditions that respond the best to fasting because fasting gives the body a chance to mobilize and eliminate those accumulated intermediary products and metabolism as well as the toxic products and unwinds itself. It's very much like rebooting the hard drive in the computer. You know, you turn it off, you turn it on, a lot of corruption clears out. The same thing happens with fasting. When it's done properly, it's a safe and effective means of giving the body a chance to do what it does best and that's heal itself. Yeah, I, I like your analogy of addicts, like with smoking, drinking. And, um, I know a lot of people that, family members, and that um, they don't, they can't connect the fact that they're eating the, the high salt, fat, uh, sweet desserts and all that, and they'll tend to blame genetics or some other issue. Um, and there was a uh, famous American philosopher called Mark Twain, and Mark Twain said, denial is not just a river in Egypt. Yeah, that's a good one. I think it's probably true. There's Nobody really, wants to admit that they have control over their addictions. And so they blame things that they have no control of. Yeah, I think that the, you know, I haven't done the fasting myself uh, in, in a longer term situation, but um, when I talked about switching to a plant based diet, I went 100%. You know, I got rid of everything and instantly did it. And, and I know there are other like, programs like Engine 2 Diet will talk about. The cadet and versus the firefighter, where they go slowly, or and I tell people that it's actually easier to go 100. percent And I think that with fasting, the fact that you completely stop that stimulation probably, you know, makes it easier in a sense. Even though people perceive it would be difficult, you know, to, to make those changes. To me, it's more it makes a quicker transition out of those addictions. Yeah, I, I tend to uh, agree that most people, uh, it's easier to just stop than to continue to tease themselves. And, you know, we don't tell alcoholics to just drink beer and wine. We tell them to quit drinking. And until they quit drinking, you know, their challenges uh, associated with alcohol continue. Um, we don't tell alcoholics to uh, put their alcohol in a smaller cup or to drink their alcohol with a spoon and put the spoon down between each sip and they won't be a drunk anymore. We tell them to quit drinking. And we need to tell obese patients the truth. Um, the fact is that there are people that can say have a drink and not become a drunk. But if you're an alcoholic, it's not you. And there are people that can occasionally indulge in some short-term pleasure-seeking, self-indulgent behavior type food and not become overweight or develop diseases. But if you're overweight or you have problems, it's not you. <laughs> if you could have controlled it, you would have controlled it. And you can't and you don't. And so figure it out. You need to stop it. You stop uh, stimulating your brain with the chemicals that you're unable to adequately regulate. And then, of course, you get free of it. Alcoholics that get free of alcohol consumption don't say, oh, no, their life's no good now. They liked it better when they were a drug. And people that get free of the dietary pleasure trap don't say, oh, I was much happier when I was fat, sick, and miserable like everybody else. And so, you know, we have to tell the truth. The truth is that if you have difficulty regulating certain chemicals in your life, you need to get rid of those chemicals. And if those chemicals are uh, sugar or oil or excess salt or whatever, you know, the most efficient strategy is going to be get rid of them. So, yeah, regarding that, because there's p people have questions about dealing with family or friends, like, would you, because that causes, you know, a fair amount of conflicts if you um, approach them in that kind of manner, like, and tell them um, to face those denial, you know, those those things that people are telling themselves. Um, is that your advice, like basically what you just said, was to to tell them straight up? Or? Uh, what I'm suggesting people do is don't tell anybody anything. Do it yourself, set an example, only answer the questions that are asked and keep your mouth shut. You don't need the stress. 
Um, the reality is you don't walk up to a person on the street and say, hey, you know how your life really sucks? It's because you're drunk. And they're going to go like, oh, it's the alcohol? I had no idea. Thank you so much. I'm not going to drink anymore. Okay, that doesn't work very well. So what you want to do is set a good example and, you know, don't become a born-again natural hygienist and try to shove your newfound knowledge down everybody else's throat. You know, you can certainly share the information that's asked. You can do it in a constructive manner. What I suggest people do is read our book, The Pleasure Trap. Dr. Lyle has put a lot of suggestions on there on how to live a healthy life without becoming a social outcast or pissing everybody else off unnecessarily. Um, and, you know, he has the same strategy, all kinds of different ways that you can present this information in a non or less threatening manner. Now, the fact is that uh, if you are successful, uh, you will engender a certain amount of irritation and jealousy amongst the people around you, particularly for a female. You know, you think about it, a woman goes on a healthy diet and loses 50 pounds and goes to work. Do you think all of her female colleagues are happy for her? And they're saying, oh, I'm so glad you lost all that weight. Or do you think that when she walks into work, they're looking at her thinking, oh, here she comes, that bitch. And they know why she lost weight, because she's a mate coaching whore. And they're not going to be supportive. They're going to bring her cupcakes and say, you know, you're no fun anymore. And it's not good to be a fanatic and ask her where she's going to get her protein from and try to undermine her success in every opportunity because they're energy vampires. They're people that do what they do best, and that's trying to make other people as sick and miserable as they are. So by comparison, they don't have to feel so bad. And so it's important to recognize that not everybody's going to be happy with your success, and not everybody's going to be supportive. So it's important to kind of, as much as you can, uh, in, uh, find people. They don't have to do what you do. You just have to find people who are willing to tolerate you doing it. So as we don't expect everybody to eat a health-promoting diet, but we do expect them to at least tolerate the fact that we're um, desiring and needing to do it. Yeah, I found that I'm... It's hard to, to, to sort of listen to the stuff that people are saying to themselves, and so I, my, I generally avoid the people and also like make new friends that are more similar to what I am doing. It's just, um, I've had people saying things that, of, you know, of how they perceive why they're in their situation they're at. And it's really hard for me to keep my mouth shut. And also like even online now you're seeing more thoughts about people posting desserts or whatever they're posting meals and, and to just bite your tongue. But it definitely works to be an example. I, that's, you know. I think it's probably easier as a male because, you know, when a male loses 50 pounds and goes to work, he doesn't get as much trouble from the other males because, well, frankly, they didn't notice. And even if they did notice, they don't care. And so men, I think, have a little bit easier time uh, than women in, in addressing these issues. But nonetheless, like you said, particularly if you're one of those loving, caring people that wants to actually help people. I'm not being critical, by the way. You can't help. It's your personality. But if you're one of those really good people, what happens is you want to share that information, but it really just doesn't work very well unless a person is interested in actively trying to seek that out. So usually a gentler, softer, quieter approach is going to be more effective than kind of a real hard, aggressive approach if your goal is to actually educate people. Yeah. If, um, if somebody is living with other people who aren't eating a healthy plant-based diet, low-fat, um, you know, how do they resist? Like, I, I don't really think that I have, like, incredible willpower. Like, I just got rid of all the stuff, and, I, you know, my taste buds adjusted. But there's people that have a partner or other family members that are eating, you know, this typical standard American diet. And uh, do you have any practical suggestions, as, as well as restaurants and that, what they could do? Well, remember, if you're struggling with food-related issues, essentially you're an addict, just like an alcoholic. So I think the same principles hold true. You don't ask everybody to eat. Uh, the same way you eat any more than an alcoholic expects nobody else to drink. But it's not unreasonable uh, for an alcoholic living with somebody uh, to, you know, express uh, a desire that it makes it easier for them if they do their drinking, say, away from the house rather than right in front of them. You don't ask alcoholic to make their first job being a bartender. Why not? Because it makes it harder. So I don't think it's unreasonable to ask your mates, your family, to say, look, you know, I'm having trouble with my issue with this problem. It would help me with my problem if you would you know, not bring this into my environment. And, you know, hopefully uh, you have a relationship where they say, okay, that's reasonable. You're not trying to impose your beliefs on them. But on the other hand, you're having them help you um, resist temptation. And as long as you acknowledge it's your problem, you're not trying to impose your belief on them. 
Uh, you know, most people are fairly reasonable when it comes to that. Um, but it is a great challenge. It's hard enough to do this when you live in a supportive environment. It's doubly difficult when you're going into an antagonistic environment or when the temptations are all around you. Um, I think that's one of the benefits of patients coming and staying at the Turner Health Center is because they're in an environment, finally, where people don't think they're a whack job just because they're trying to get healthy. And they can get support and they can uh, improve their self-efficacy by successfully implementing these patterns and seeing the tremendous success that occurs. That makes it somewhat easier when they go home uh, to have confidence that if they can figure out a way to overcome the pleasure trap, they'll find success you know, in their life and with their health. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think there's a lot of value in that, removing yourself from, especially at the beginning. Um, I know you've talked about this before, but people ask, um, water fasting, and you offer juice fasting, but if you could talk about the difference and why someone might do one versus the other. Well, um, juice fasting or mono, mono diets or modified feed programs can be very helpful. They're quite gentle. Um, they're perfectly appropriate for a wide variety of people. Water fasting can be an intense and miserable experience. However, it's also very effective and efficient at giving the body a chance to heal itself, much more so than modified feeding or juice fasting programs. So water fasting is not for everybody, but for the people that it's appropriate for, there's nothing that really works quite the same way as water fasting. So not everybody needs to water fast, not everybody can water fast. And so those patients that water fasting isn't appropriate or desirable for them, we will certainly do modified programs for them at the True North Health Center. Um, but what we're known for is that we're one of the few places in the world that um, has uh, qualified physicians and are capable of doing medically supervised long-term water only fasting. And so uh, about 80% of the people that we see are actually coming specifically for uh, supervised water only fasting. We've done that 15,000 times over the last... Uh, 30 years, and I uh, have a very good track record in terms of being able to do it safely and effectively. Um. The, the thing about water fasting that's different than, say, juice fasting, is that juice fasting, you earn basically the same physiology as feeding, just if you're on a lower caloric diet without fiber. On water fasting, it's a unique biological adaptation. Even the brain itself, your main burner of glucose, shifts to burning ketones, a byproduct of fat metabolism, and the physiology in the body completely changes into a very unique situation that only occurs in water-only fasting. And in that water-only fasting state, uh, a lot of these mechanisms are greatly sped up. And as a consequence, uh, things that will heal, sometimes in days or weeks of fasting, would take enormously longer periods of time feeding. And so our goal a lot of times is try to get people where they're out of pain, get them comfortable, get them off their medications and stable, so that when they're eating well, they can get healthier faster than they're getting sick. So fasting is a great facilitator. It kind of makes things happen faster. So like you mentioned medications. Um, if people come in there and they start doing the, the fasting, the water fasting, a lot of, I guess a lot of those meds would be scaled down over a period of time. Well, what would happen is they would come in and we would scale down their medication in a controlled feeding or juice fasting program, get them off their medications, and then move them into water on the fasting. There are very few medications that you would actually water fast on. Um, most medications are eliminated beforehand. But remember, most people are medicated not for their condition but for their diet. And as soon as you begin changing the diet, the need for medication is reduced. The problem is these medications are highly toxic substances that need to be managed appropriately, too rapid or too slow, a withdrawal can result in disaster. Fortunately, we have a number of medical doctors that are not complete idiots. And as a consequence, they're able to advise people intelligently about how to wean those medications off carefully, appropriately. And we get people off, get them stable, put them through the fasting process, and then oftentimes the need for medication has been eliminated. And so as they come back into the refeeding phase of the program, um, they're able to eliminate the need for medications. Um, so, is it basically a, a, a situation of, of, the, of the speed of, of healing? Like, for example, um, gut leakage, uh, you know, if, if you were, if somebody was doing fasting or somebody just switched to a, a plant-based diet, is, is it essentially um, just a rate of healing or is there things that wouldn't happen if you're, if you're eating 
I think most things eventually would happen if you can control diet and lifestyle well enough, long enough. The problem is it's very difficult to control diet and lifestyle well enough, long enough in a free living population. One, because not everybody is always perfectly compliant with the diet choices. Two, there's other variables uh, in terms of stress, in terms of you know environmental exposures that are in addition to the dietary factors. In a controlled setting and fasting, you're able to control everything. And as a consequence, things that might take months of uh, diligent dietary compliance happen in days or weeks of fasting. Once people feel better, their ability to comply improves. And so I think a lot of people would never get well without that boost. It's not because they couldn't, it's just they wouldn't. Uh, because it's so difficult. Even when you're feeling good, even when you've got everything going for you, you have a supportive environment, you've got the education and inspiration, it's still a difficult challenge. I would say it's the most, the most difficult thing people ever do in their life adopting a health-promoting diet in a world designed to make them fat, sick, and miserable. Because the forces of evil are very great. It's almost like a war that you're entering. Uh, and the forces against you uh, have conspired to give you what you want, not what you need. And what you want is dopamine, this, that, that neurochemical in your brain that's associated with pleasure. And the best way to get dopamine is short-term pleasure-seeking, self-indulgent behavior. That's why you have so many alcoholics and drug addicts and people indulging in dietary indiscretions. Uh, and, and other activities uh, that relate to the diet, dietary and lifestyle pleasure traps. So the forces against you are great. The forces for you are, are usually limited to one of two things. Either people are smart and motivated intellectually or they're in agonizing pain and ability and they'll do anything, even dangerous things like eat good exercise or go to bed on time. And so most of our patients start off uh, being sick and miserable and that motivates them to be willing to adopt this. In the long run, the people that stick with it are doing it because they really like being healthy and happy. And that's enough to overcome all the temptations. Uh, but it's, you know, it's a certain percentage of the population that's capable of doing this. It's not going to be for everybody. You know a lot of people that are never going to be willing to make last. For example, you know people that are smoking, they know smoking is bad for them, but they'd rather die than quit smoking, and they will. And so for them, that's their choice. I'd certainly you know, defend their right to make those uh, foolish decisions. But as far as people that want to be healthy and happy, they got to know the principle. Health results from healthful living. Healthful living involves diet, sleep, and exercise. Fasting can be a great facilitator, but ultimately it comes back to diet, sleep, and exercise. Um, what people... Somebody asked about uh, contraindications like heart arrhythmia or certain scenarios that they wouldn't necessarily be a candidate for water fasting? Do you have any? Jobs? Well, every patient, we review their medical history, we look at their laboratory results, we do a physical examination and make a determination whether mm -hmm. fasting would be appropriate or if not, water fasting, perhaps we might do modified program juice fasting. Um, and there are a number of uh, contraindications to water-only fasting, not the least of which is fear of fasting. People who don't really have an understanding of how the process goes. I mean, let's face it. Most people think if they get on a plane in New York and fly all the way to California, if they don't eat those peanuts, they'll like starve to death over Colorado. They think the peanuts saved their life. I mean, you know, because the reality is once people are fully educated and understand how fasting works, the body works, they're a better candidate for fasting. There are a number of medications uh, that need to be eliminated before people can fast, and there's a number of medications that can't be arbitrarily discontinued without putting a person at risk. So. That can be a complicated issue. There are some conditions, particularly uh, when kidney disease is too progressive to allow for compensation of fasting, or um, cardiac rhythm is uh, unstable enough that they they wouldn't be able to handle the the uh, transition to fasting. You know, these kinds of conditions may uh, uh, preclude doing water only fasting. But you know, everybody can adopt healthy living, so it's just a question of the magnitude and the approach that's going to be taken. I was asked. Um by Donna, there was an, or I think it was her husband on an elimination diet, so he wasn't eating very much uh, variety, just a few basic foods for gout, and um, it didn't seem to be working. And they are, he's, he's six feet tall, 144 pounds, which is pretty thin in my opinion. So um, if, if, if they're doing a, a pretty limited diet and they're not uh, getting the results, would that be something that fasting you think could potentially help if you evaluate? Well, I, I think you have to really evaluate the individual patient. And remember, you know, gout can be involved, ultimately be involved in dietary choices, but over the short run, 
kidney function, other issues may be involved. So you have to figure out where the problem is. Uh, in some cases, you have to clear the system. It might even require the use of medications in order to stabilize the person. So I don't think we can make too general a, a statement about a given individual. Usually, uh, people that are very thin, if you do fasting, it's going to be shorter term rather than longer term. But even a thin person can often go through a period of fasting if that's appropriate. Um, but, you know, when we start getting into, you know, specific individuals and their condition, the first thing you want to make sure is, is the diagnosis even right? You know, a significant percentage of people we see are given a diagnosis that's just wrong. And so if they don't have the right diagnosis, then they're making assumptions based on false premises. So, yeah, you know, we always want to start at the beginning. Review the history, do an exam, take a look at the lab, and have people that are intelligent to, you know, evaluate that and come up with a conclusion that hopefully is accurate. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Do you... I know you mentioned, I was reading some of the, the documentation that you sent me, and it's, it sounded like when people start to fast, there's a bit of a protein, like after the glycogen is used up and that, there's a, a bit of protein use, like muscle um, usage, and then it switches to, you know, ketones and fat burning. Um, how much protein or muscle loss would there be, um, do, you, do you think, when somebody goes to water fasting? And this well, is... You don't lose any muscle cells. Uh, during fasting, you do use some of the juice inside the cells, just like you don't use fat cells, you use the, the labile materials in the cells themselves. And so whatever uh, muscle is used for necessary gluconeogenesis, that's going to be replenished, you know, presumably post-fasting when you eat and exercise. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that, yeah, there's about 75 grams of protein the first day, but that dr dramatically reduces as you go into the fasting state. Because the, the reason you have to mobilize uh, protein in fasting is to maintain uh, glucose through gluconeogenesis once glycogenolysis has depleted the glycogen reserves. So one of the important things in fasting to minimize protein utilization is rest. That's why one of the reasons why during fasting we enforce rest. We don't engage in aerobic activity and have people uh, in uh, high stress situations because the biggest burner of glucose in the human body is that large bulbous neuronal net at the end of your spinal column called the brain. Now the brain fortunately is a bifuel organ. It's very in, uh, unusual, but humans are one of the few creatures that actually has a bifuel brain. So once you go into the fasting state, the brain shifts over and changes from burning glucose to burning ketones, a byproduct of fat metabolism. So quite rapidly as you go into the fasting state, the body and the brain shift fuels to burning ketones, which is derived from your fat stores. And so the body, by the end of the second week, for example, a vast majority of all energy is derived from fat. And so the amount of protein used in fasting, particularly when fasting is done properly when people rest, uh, is minimized. And that's essentially what the adaptation to fasting is all about, is to conserve protein, uh, rely on fat stores, and give the body a chance to mobilize and process the nutrients as it needs to. Um, do you, do you work with athletes at all? And, um, are they concerned with that, any potential loss of ability or strength during that time? Absolutely. And, and the biggest problem, of course, when you fast, you rest. And when you rest, you tend to lose conditioning and talent. And so athletes whose primary focus is maximizing uh, athletic performance are concerned about the short-term effect of fasting or resting or any of these approaches. However, the good news is that athletes also recover very quickly. And so as long as uh, there's enough time allocated for post-fasting recovery, uh, most athletes find that fasting is a long-term beneficial impact on their athletic performance, uh, although absolutely there's going to be a short-term consequence. So you have to time it in relationship to your athletic um, performances so that you have adequate re recovery time. Yeah, makes sense. Um... What's your take on like just generally calories in and out? Um, I mean, it seems common sense, but I know that people, especially in the high carb area, that sort of think that you know the carbs don't turn to fat and you can eat sort of a huge amount well, of calories. It's, it's not quite. I mean, clearly, it, essentially, it comes down to calories in and calories out. But calories in and calories out includes the fact that uh, a big part of digestion absorption is involves the actual process of assimilating food. So, for example, if you eat a high-fat meal and 
um, that fat is not absorbed, but shown into the colon and eliminated as fatty stools. Obviously, the calories derived from that meal may be different than if you have highly absorbable materials that uh, the body sucks up. If you have rapid versus slow transit time, if you have, if you, even things like chewing your food and, that and how well it, um, it's exposed uh, for digestion, um, the entire digestive process itself can, can play a role in terms of your total caloric balance. How, what your feeding window is, things like intermittent fasting, when you narrow the feeding window, may alter both uh, the total calories that are consumed uh, to reach satiety and what, what your body does with it. So it's a little bit more complicated than just taking a bomb calorimeter, oxidizing a food and determining how many you know, units of energy there are versus what your body's gonna do with it. The good news is though, for people that adopt vegan SOS-free diets, um, and are able to engage in appropriate activity, these patients usually can rely on their satiation mechanisms uh, to guide them in terms of quantity of intake. And so people eating large amounts of fruits and salads and steamed vegetables and starch-based vegetables generally are able to avoid obesity and the consequences of dietary excess without necessarily having to weigh, measure, count, and, and scale their foods. Now it is true that you know, your body actually wants to hold on to a certain amount of fat because if spring comes late, it wants to make you survive. And it's also true that when you're losing fat, your brain is notifying you that, hey, you know, you're hemorrhaging strategic fat reserves. So it's something for you to be aware of. I mean, it's, it's much, I think, uh, a more dynamic process losing weight than maintaining weight. And so you know, when you take all these things into consideration, you realize that um, it's, it's more complicated than just measuring how many calories you're going to eat in terms of determining what your overall percent body fat balance is going to be. The, the, the strength of this kind of approach is for most people, they can eat to their fill of low-density foods uh, and end up getting to their optimum weight without having to worry too much about it. Yeah, it's just natural, like the animals they, they, that don't live with us. Um, so in, in relation to that, there's people talking about this Minnesota starvation experiment and sort of metabolic issues or damage that happen whenever somebody calorie restricts or fasts or even um, yo-yo dieting. And, you know, this was, I think, only a six-month situation. But if, if, you know, young women especially are doing calorie restriction, anorexia, that type of thing um, for years potentially, and they go to a, a very high-calorie sort of high-carb diet, a lot of them, because I get emails, uh, a lot of them are gaining quite a bit of weight for, you know, beyond what their normal weight is, they gain 50 plus pounds. Um, do you think, like, what are your thoughts on that as far as like the duration of any metabolic adjustments or? Well, it turns out that with fasting, uh, then the notion that uh, if you do a water fast, uh, that your metabolic rate goes down and stays down and is, is fundamental to our, is, isn't as a wise tale. It's not really supported by uh, the scientific literature, and in fact, in our own experimentation um, with using calorimetry and looking at fasting, we see that number one, the body goes into fat mobilization very rapidly, and that it comes back and normalizes its uh, uh, metabolic rates also rapidly. The general rule of thumb that we use is the length of the fast. So while it is true, you'll probably regain fat more effectively initially after a period of deprivation. Um, if, you're, if you do systematic refeeding, which is what we do in a controlled setting here after fasting, uh, once the person stabilizes, there's no evidence of uh, persistent reduction in metabolic rates or, or other variables. What can happen, though, is as people get healthier, their absorptive capacities increase. They absorb more efficiently. They make better use of their food. They need less fuel in order to sustain their optimal weight, health, and energy. And so uh, if somebody's saying they take a person that used to be sick, and wasn't absorbing what they eat, and now they get healthy and they absorb their food more efficiently, that may very well be true. That's not an evidence of pathology. It's just to mean that you're, you're less able to indulge in the dietary pleasure trap without the consequences. Uh, but adopting a health-promoting diet uh, certainly wouldn't result in uh, a rebound of significant uh, uh, weight or uh, uh, fat. So, you know, it's kind of an academic argument that you're making that what, what getting healthy is a bad thing because you can absorb food better. It's not because of a slowdown in your metabolic rate. Well, there's a, there's a concept that um, the, 
if somebody, so what's happening is people, women, especially girls, um, they're gaining quite a bit of weight beyond their normal weight on a high fruit, um, like smoothies and, and dates and that kind of thing. But when you eat a high sugar diet, I don't care if the sugar is from sucrose or fructose, fructose may be even worse. Of course you're going to have problems. I say worse because fructose is processed in the liver much like alcohol is. So in terms of cirrhosis and other issues, that's probably even bigger risk. So there's nothing natural about taking a highly processed food materials, including fruit, blending it up, adding really concentrated sugars like dates, and pretending that that's not going to have an excess caloric load and result in weight gain. That's not the kind of diet we're talking about. We're talking about a diet from whole foods. So it would be whole fruit, not blended, juiced, processed uh, uh, foods in concentration. So I see an awful lot of people that are doing uh, supposedly healthy diets that are high in fat, high in sugar, which is basically high in high fruit diets, and having all kinds of health consequences. In fact, if you look at those populations of patients, the first year or two, they usually do okay because they're coming off the standard American diet of dietary excess. But eventually, these high sugar, high fat diets can lead to depletion issues. So the characteristically, you'll see patients that are having problems with their teeth, nail, hairs, uh, bladder infections, um, emotional volatility uh, issues with uh, uh, recurrent infections. And these problems are often resolved by getting a person on a healthier diet, which is more salad, uh, whether it's raw or cooked vegetable material, higher meal content, get away from the high sugar, high fat diets that are often being advocated by people. So you know, we have a slightly different view on what a health promoting diet is. But it's certainly not going to be relying on the juice from the blender as the mainstay of your caloric intake, but rather whole foods. So if, if somebody, if a girl was like um, 18 or 19, whatever, and they, uh, for a f quite a few years, they've calorie restricted or maybe, um, you know, they get to a point now they're eating a high carb. If there was an uh, additional weight gain beyond like just reaching a normal weight, that should, re that should um, recover or, or return to normal fairly rapidly, you would say? Like, it doesn't depend on the fact that they've been doing it for years, uh, off, you know, up and down. In my experience, uh, if people adopt an appropriate diet, they maintain appropriate weight. And does regardless of the fact that they may have had some um, physiological abuse from dietary manipulations in the past. Now, clearly, it can take people a time to recover, whether they're using uh, amphetamines or they're engaging in bulimic uh, behavior. I mean, all of these things can certainly impact people's health. But ultimately, in my experience, particularly I've got a contained environment, a controlled environment, you feed people generous quantities of low-density foods, which is basically vegetable-based foods, salads, steamed vegetables, and their weight responds very quickly. You know, I keep waiting for these, you know, violations of the laws of physics and thermodynamics, but, you know, I just don't see them. Yeah, that's... That includes people that are very overweight. They lose their two pounds a week down to their optimum weight. I mean, some of them are with me for a year. And you see the curve, it's very predictable. And I also have patients that have had you know, difficulties with eating related disorders. The challenge there is not the physiology. If you can get the food consumption right, you get the weight consumption right. But dealing with the psychological issues can be profound. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, there's also a big difference in patient population of anorexic patients versus bulimic patients. So you, they call them all eating disorders. But you know, a lot of bulimic patients basically have a maladaptive behavior pattern. They don't want to be fat, but they're caught in the dietary pleasure trap. And so they're trying to come up with a strategy to feed their addiction without being fat. And they'll engage in the use of laxatives, or they engage of uh, vomiting, or they may engage in excess exercise, or other kinds of extreme behaviors in order to regulate their fat. Once they learn that they can maintain a healthy weight uh, and not be in conflict with their own brain's tidy mechanism, sometimes they find uh, peace and they're able to get into a balance and, and be successful. Anorexia nervosa is actually a neuropsychiatric condition that's a lot more involved. It's not quite um, as simple as that. And so that, you know, that can be much more complicated. And we have significantly more uh, experience and success in helping people with uh, uh, bulimic behaviors or binge eating behaviors than we do uh, anorexia nervosa, which is, I see it's really more psych neuropsychiatric condition. Yeah, and, I, and I, the important, I think, what you mentioned, um, just to reiterate, is that if somebody was underweight from anorexia or whatever, um, there would be a refeeding, a slow, uh, some kind of a, a structured increase in calories. You're not just going to go from that state to a highly, a high calorie, you know, high carb. Well, we're, we, 
you know, all of our patients are fed uh, high carbohydrate diets. They're not fed high refined carbohydrate diets. So we're not giving people large quantities of simple sugars. We don't use, um, you know, refined, we don't use the, the flour products. We don't use all the, what most people call carbohydrates. But vegetables are high carbohydrate foods. And so if you're eating lots of salad, lots of steamed vegetables, lots of starch veg starchy vegetables, you're on a high carbohydrate diet. As a breakdown, our programs are typically around 12% of calories from protein, about 15 to 18% of calories from fat, with the balance coming from whole food carbohydrates, mm -hmm. vegetable-based materials. Sounds good. <laughs> so they're not, it's not technically a low-fat diet in the sense that, you know, we're, we are using for most patients uh, up to an ounce of nuts, uh, uh, perhaps some avocado. Now, there are people that, that foods like nuts may be trigger foods and they really can't regulate the quantity. And those, for those patients, we'll often use things like flax seeds or, or chia seeds or some other high omega-3 fatty acid uh, food to get those um, fatty acids insured uh, in the diet. But for most people, that are able to portion control some of these higher fat vegetable based foods, you know, the total caloric breakdown ends up being around 15%, sometimes a little bit more of their calories from fat. And um, they're still complex carbohydrates, that's the bulk of the diet. Yeah. And with regard to fruit, like I know Dr. McDougall does somewhat limit it uh, for most people, you know, one to four, um, and he wants it to be a starch based diet, but do you, do you have any restrictions on fruit at all? That's well, it something. depends on the patient. Obviously, for people that are um, struggling with conditions like diabetes, you regulate the amount of simple sugars because it'll help you control blood sugar levels until the body's been making a healing response. For people that are struggling with weight, you don't give them dried fruits and blended fruits and juices and all kinds of processed foods. We stick to whole fruit. Uh, and fruit, you know, the fruits we eat today do tend to be fairly high sugar, hybridized foods. Rather than if you go to Hawaii and look at the wild apples, they're pretty high fi They look more like vegetables, what we call vegetables today. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I'd say that, you know, it, there's definitely a percentage of the population that can't eat all the fruit they want and necessarily maintain optimum health and function. Uh, but for most people, they're able to include generous amounts of whole fruit, raw and cooked vegetables in their diet, and we don't have to get too fussy about is it one piece or two pieces or three pieces, depending on the patient. Now, for those that are suffering with specific health issues, those, those rules change. I mean, some people, we don't have on any fruit, we have on no fruit at all. There are some people, for example, we don't have on salad materials because they've got highly inflamed intestinal mucosas that don't deal with salad well at that point with the uh, active ulcerative colitis, et cetera. So we may be mostly steamed and starchy vegetables for those patients. So you have to make the diet meet the physiology of the patient rather than have some arbitrary diet that supposedly you're going to shove everybody into. Yeah, because like with fruit, there's a lot of people, you know, that I deal with, like, um, and they don't like when it's implied that it's not healthy. Like if you say, you know, this certain person can't eat too much fruit because the sugars um, go, you know, in the bloodstream or we want to, in certain scenarios, we're going to limit, like they just think fruit's healthy and there's, you should never. That's, that's a rather arbitrary and uh, ignorant view. I mean, uh, those people that are saying that probably haven't had the benefit of actually looking at patients and watch what happens when you use different feeding regimes. And what happens to those people is the people that do what they suggest and survive with it are the followers and the ones that crash and burn go away and they're not aware of it because they're not living with them, they're not following them, they're not clinically following these patients. A lot of times they get a really skewed view of what they think is going on. They're only seeing the success, the, the people that got off the standard American diet and did better. And they also don't track those patients sometimes because I see them a lot of times where they've done well on a raw uh, food diet for a year or two. But then they start to crash and burn, and they're still being told, well, everything's a healing crisis. Mm -hmm. Well, everything's not a healing crisis. Sometimes you've got the body where you're putting it physiologically under stress it's not able to adapt to. And so you modify the diet to meet the needs of the person, not your arbitrary, capricious philosophy. Yeah, that's really good. Um, so you mentioned flour. Um, like as far as, you know, there's a general idea in the, in the vegan or high-carb thing that whole grain uh, bread and... Pasta is, is acceptable. So, what's your take? Because you say you don't. Oh, do certainly. No, there's a certain percentage of the population that are sensitive to certain grains, like uh, glutinous grains, for example, wheat, rye, barley. Those patients that have celiac disease, those people that have gluten sensitivity issues, are better off without those particular kind of grains. Um, grains uh, themselves 
not everybody digests grains and does well with grains. There's many people that just don't do well with grains and they're better off using their starch from vegetable based materials. But for those that, that have that don't have an issue with grain, you gotta remember they are very concentrated though. So for people that are trying to do weight management, either increase or decrease the weight, if you're trying to lose weight, a lot of times people find you know, using more low density foods like uh, salads and steamed vegetables, it's easier for them to regulate their weights. If they eat too much of the grain products, even healthy grains like brown rice, etc., they have more difficulty dealing with those last few pounds that they're trying to, to, trying to address. Um, uh, grains and beans, for those people that can digest them, if they, if they eat within their capacities, uh, I think they can sustain a high degree of health and that can be fine. For those that don't do well with them, then that's no problem. They don't have to have those particular sources of carbohydrate in order to, for, for their health to thrive. Some people may do, uh, oh, as far as the flour products though, most people do well with, like if we do quinoa or we do rice, whatever, whole, uh, minimally processed, uh, but you turn it into a flour, you increase caloric density. For people trying to lose weight, they usually are better avoiding flour products of any kind. For people trying to gain weight, or maybe your competitive athlete who's running 35, 4,000 calories a day and has trouble finding enough hours to eat all these fruits and vegetables, using something like a rice or, uh, pasta or a or more processed uh, flour-based product may find that actually helps them in terms of just increasing their caloric density without having to increase their, say, percentage of calories fat too high. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I know some athletes that are doing... Eat, drink, you know, taking oil in, like coconut or whatever, because they need the calories, but... Yeah, we don't recommend any free oil, so if you want to increase your fat, we still recommend that you keep your percentage of calories of fat in that, you know, 15 to 18 percent of calories, but maybe you have an avocado instead of half an avocado. Maybe you have two ounces and that's instead of one ounce and that's, but we still wouldn't recommend any free oils, any highly processed, any more than we would free sugars or any other highly processed food products. And it's absolutely, it, you're absolutely able to get enough caloric density in using these things we've discussed by increasing the, uh, keeping the percentage the same, but making sure that you get enough total fat in the diet and using maybe some uh, uh, non-glutinous flour-based products. Those are ways of increasing caloric density. And, the, and that athlete may find that in order to get enough uh, total calories, and they may increase the percentage of calories that they do maybe for more concentrated foods like dry foods or other foods as well. So again, you have to modify the diet to meet the needs of the individual. But let's be clear about something. The diet that's associated with optimum short-term athletic performance may not be the diet associated with long-term health. Yeah. So there's many things competitive athletes do to increase their performance that may not be increasing their health. And so you have to decide, are you, is your sole purpose to maximize your performance on the field today versus is my performance desire to build and sustain long-term health? Now, you know, I advise patients generally whose goal is optimum health, not necessarily optimum performance. So they have to kind of, if the goal is optimum performance, you may have to do some things that maybe aren't necessarily the same. Yeah, just to understand the trade-off that you're well, making. It's not going to be oils from my view. Yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> um, let's see here. Oh, well, we, is there any specific foods, like somebody mentioned psoriatic arthritis, and obviously, you know, fasting and things can help um, in, in the plant-based food in general, or plant-based diet, but are there any foods specific for, for certain things like that? Yeah, well, like psoriatic arthritis, like other autoimmune diseases, autoimmune diseases are diseases where your body's immune system begins to attack your own tissues. So when you have rheumatoid arthritis, it's your immune system that's causing the joint deformities. When you have ulcerative colitis, it's your immune system that's attacking your colon. When you have arthritis, when you have asthma, when you have psoriasis, these conditions are all your immune system attacking your body. So the medical approach is let's take things to shut down your immune system. And at first, it's like a dream because you have less symptoms. Then it becomes a nightmare because it turns out you need your immune system. <laughs> so when you shut it down with methotrexate or prednisone or whatever, there's some long-term consequences. So our approach is a different approach. We say, um, let's find out why you, uh, or what we can do to get your immune system to be less hyperreactive. It turns out that one common factor associated with many autoimmune disorders is gut leakage, where people absorb proteins 
through the intestinal mucosa that seem to be associated with triggering the immune system in genetically vulnerable people to attack itself. Well, what we do to reduce gut leakage is fasting. We fast people till the inflammation goes down, and you can measure acute phase reactive proteins and other things to measure inflammation and watch that calm down. And then let's put people on a diet that isn't free or is, isn't abundant in the things that cause inflammation and lead to gut leakage. For example, excess free radicals. So people that eat free oils and people that smoke cigarettes and drink alcohol. Uh, these uh, uh, behaviors um, yield a lot of free radicals that are thought to be associated with production of gut leakage. Uh, so we eliminate those things from the diet. We eliminate the dairy products. We eliminate the, the refined carbohydrates and the processed foods, the heated oils. And lo and behold, these patients, their autoimmune diseases often come under control, and you can maintain control with careful diet and lifestyle over the long run. And so we have excellent results in helping people with these conditions. Uh, sometimes it can take a fast or two or three. Sometimes it takes a very diligent dietary control. But in the long run, these patients can often get off their medications and stabilize. Um, and so what foods specifically are most antagonistic to um, Autoimmune diseases, including psoriatic arthritis, well, animal foods like meat, fish, fowl, eggs, dairy products, their high arachidonic acid and other irritating substances are thought to associate with gut leakage. Um, SOS, which is you know the international symbol of danger, also stands for sugars, oils, and salt. So free oils of all kinds, including coconut oil and olive oil and all the other oils. Sugars, including agave syrup and maple syrup and all kind of vomit and honey and all the different kinds of refined carbohydrates, and, and free uh, added salt. Um, all of these things, we believe, are, are detrimental and need to be avoided. We also avoid, uh, for most of these patients, their uh, gluten sensitive or a higher percentage of autoimmune patients in the population are gluten sensitive. So we eliminate uh, gluten-based grains. And then whatever other foods they individually may be sensitive to, for some of them it's grains in general, it might be beans, it might be certain nuts or seeds, people have different food sensitivities. Uh, we eliminate those factors and find the foods that they can eat to promote their health. Later, they may be able to eat a broader diet uh, with some uh, success. Sometimes people can't eat foods every day, but they might be able to rotate foods in once a week and, and, and function and do okay with that. So again, Modify the diet to meet the needs of the person and their condition. But the general rules are we eliminate animal foods and SOS. We talk about it as a vegan, SOS-free diet for most all people. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great summary of that. Uh, let's see. We're pretty much got through most of these, which is great. Uh, is, there, is, is infections, Lyme disease type thing, is that similar to what you said about well, Lyme disease is, can be very difficult. All these spirochetal diseases, including syphilis and other conditions, can be difficult. Uh, traditionally, if you have acute Lyme disease and you're treated with antibiotics, the antibiotics are thought to be effective. Unfortunately, many times Lyme disease isn't detected early and it can become uh, a serious problem. Many people with Lyme disease um, actually also have concomitant autoimmune disease. And so if they're given antibiotics which suppress the immune system, they may feel a little better, and they're misattributing their relief to the treatment of Lyme, when in real, reality it may be medically managing their autoimmune disease. Some of those patients you fast and they get better, not necessarily because you cured their Lyme disease, but because you managed what actually is another part of their diagnosis. So, you know, people can have more than one problem. They can have Lyme, they can have autoimmune disease. You can treat their Lyme, and they can still have autoimmune disease, but, you know, and also Lyme itself gives other... Uh, infections that can be correlated with it, uh, and it can get really quite complicated. So I wouldn't propose to say that we've got a simple uh, solution mm -hmm. uh, to, to uh, uh, Lyme disease. But um, what I would say is that, you know, again, health results from healthful living, whether you have Lyme or something else, these basic principles of a healthy diet, sleep, exercise, uh, consideration of fasting are probably applicable to a wide variety of people, uh, and many people can get tremendous benefit from that. Some people are also going to need medical care. Some people are also going to need psychotherapy. You know, there's other things that it takes for some people to get where they need to go. Mm -hmm. For people that are interested, though, we do offer a free service that might be of, uh, of interest to some, which is if people go onto our website at www.truenorthhealth.com, they can fill in what are called registration forms, which uh, gets me their medical history, and they can call me for a free phone consultation. Okay. And what I can do is review their history with them and talk to them about if 
there's something that they can do that they're not already doing, or if there's something that we can help them in terms of assessment or, or fasting or something that might be relevant. And so, you know, I'm happy to have that conversation. All they have to do is fill out the registration forms and, and give us a call. And uh, if they go to our website at truenorthhealth.com, they'll also find all of our published studies, many articles. We have something called True North TV with video clips that they can download and get a lot of information that might help them kind of evaluate whether they're doing everything they can to maximize their health. Yeah, that's really great. Um, so is there anything else as far as, you know, I know you do speaking and there's um, anything else you'd like to mention, like your books or your... Um, any well, upcoming? I do think you know, my favorite book is called The Pleasure Trap. Mm -hmm. And it's Mastering the Hidden Force that Undermines Health and Happiness. It's a disturbing book. It doesn't tell people what they want to hear. But it does tell them what they need to know to get and stay healthy. And it also, the first two-thirds of the book are about, you know, this dietary pleasure trap concepts. And the last third is about fasting. So it has a lot of information in there. Uh, and I certainly encourage uh, people to use that. For those that are looking for vegan SOS-free recipes to make the food a little bit easier to make and interesting. We have two cookbooks. One is called the Health Promoting Cookbook. Simple vegan SOS free recipes that even I can make. And we have a new book called the Bravo Cookbook by our, our chef Ramses Bravo. It's excellent. Again, recipes that are all from whole foods, not processed crap, and uh, that are available to that, you know anybody uh, can make. You don't have to be a gourmet chef to make it turn out good. So, you know, those are resources that uh, Again, they can read about those on our website. If people do have questions, they're certainly free to call me. Sounds great. Yeah, I'll definitely put all the links to that uh, below the video. And I've, I love the pleasure trap, and I recommend that everybody definitely pick those up, and it'll definitely help with some of their issues. And and I noticed your website has a lot of great resources, like there's a lot of articles as yes. well. And um, it's great that they can contact you if they need any more specific information as well. And for those that want to support... Um, health promoting research, um, our foundation, the True North Health Foundation, is actually a 501c3 nonprofit health education organization. And if people shop on Amazon, we're one of the Amazon charities. If they select True North, that's one word, True North Health, as their charity, then Amazon donates uh, every month for a percentage of what's purchased to uh, the foundation. So we certainly appreciate your help in that regard. Well, that's great. Okay, well, thanks so much, Dr. Goldhammer. And Pretty good. Anytime.